Thanks, Greg. Um, today's topic um, is part one of two webinars we're presenting uh, over a couple of weeks. Uh, the first one is about improving the performance of beef production systems in Northern Australia. And the second one is about uh, low cost strategies that aid resilience in the Northern beef industry. Um, I would like to acknowledge that a fair bit of this talk has already been presented at Beef Australia, but we've renewed it and revisited it. So if you saw it at Beef Australia, you will get some new stuff. Um, I'd like to also say that there are three of us who are responsible for this work. Myself, um, an economist. Trudy Oxley um, works with the Northern Territory uh, Department um, and has greatly assisted with the, with, with the exercise and examples from up there. And uh, Marie Bowen, who uh, works in Rocky um, and is a nutritionist by trade. And uh, without those other authors uh, and helpers, this wouldn't be possible. So uh, we'll um, also acknowledge that the ongoing funding for this work comes out of the Drought and Climate Adaptation Program. So that's fairly important that somebody actually funds the work. Now, uh, moving on. The, when we look at performance, the sort of questions I as an economist like to ask are, what are the strategies most likely to improve the profit and resilience of your beef production system? So most properties are in existence. There's no new beef property. So it's about what's going to improve the current system in terms of profit and resilience. And because there's a lot of strategies and a lot of different strategies, we can't cover them all today. So if you're thinking about change and you're thinking about changing the way you manage your beef property, how can you assess the alternative strategy? Now, the final point is that when you're looking at to improve the performance of a beef production system, the only way to measure whether you are actually improving it is to measure the change in profit which is what we'll be all about today. So the approach we applied um, when, when uh, undertaking this piece of work is, we looked at different regions across the North and for that region, we modeled a representative property, which we thought represented the median or the most common production system in that region. To do that, we incorporated any survey data, research and trial data we could find that was relevant for that region. We, we, we talked to people and applied a representative management strategy that was typical of that region. And then against that template, we assessed the value of change by comparing alternative strategies to the current strategy. So there was always a comparison. This is what we think people are doing. This is what we think they could change. So there was always a comparison. Now, there's a number of targets across Northern Australia where we're targeting this sort of exercise. Um, some of these are yet to be done. But the ones we're going to discuss today, one we did at Catherine, a uh, fairly large property. Um, another one that we've got underway in the North Queensland Gulf catchment area, a smaller property. Um, and then uh, one we've done in the Fitzroy region where we've got higher quality uh, country and a more favorable climate. So they're the three that we're going to be looking at today. A little bit more detail. Now, if you want to look at the detail of these three regions, there is actually a, a 216 page draft report on the Future Beef website. You can download and have a look at these topics in detail if you want to. Now, where do we get the data for this sort of exercise? Over time, we've worked with about 30 property owners and managers across Northern Australia to look at case studies, looking at their options. So we've got a fair bit of on the ground knowledge of what people are doing. We identified key technologies that were relevant to these people. We identified them with the industry people and uh, uh, research development extension staff. Uh, we then gathered up whatever data we could look for in terms of survey research data that gave us responses to change. We used uh, sources like the Cash Cow Project, a major project across Northern Australia looking at reproduction efficiency. We, look, we used things like the Determining Property Level Rates of Breeder Cow Mortality in Northern Australia Project, which was a project done a, a couple of years ago now that looked at uh, rates of mortality across this region. Uh, high Output Forages Project in CQ looked at different way people use forages, phosphorus supplementation in, of Brahmin heifers in phosphorus deficient country. Uh, current project underway in the Northern Territory that I, is identifying some really interesting things. And then anything else we could find in terms of research 
and extension publications that would give us uh, an understanding of what was uh, available to these people. When we were building these models, we obviously had to use a set of prices and costs to talk about, well, this is what we think uh, the profitability of these properties is without change. We, we look back at prices over time and we selected price sets that we thought represented um, the history of these properties. So we, we looked at the last decade or so that different prices were used in different regions. Um, the, the different, uh, we looked at the different classes of cattle on these properties like cows or steers or heifers and said, well, there's different prices for these different classes of cattle. So we, we put in different price bases. And obviously, we've got no idea about where the future of these prices is going to go. So we don't think they indicate any expectation for the future trend of future prices. So it's just we used historical prices to, to, as a bit of a basis. And for something like live export steers out of Townsville, where we've only got a few years data, we compared the recent data with the, with the Darwin price and worked out, oh, well, it's about 30 cents a kilo different on average. So we, then we could extend that price back and use it some of that extra data. Now, let's have a look at the Fitzroy region to start with, what we looked at there. Um, it's um, sort of west of Rockhampton and is the, is the Fitzroy catchment. A lot of people know where it is. It's, it's interesting in terms of northern cattle production because 42% of the area available for grazing in this area is, is actually arable soil. So there's good quality soils there that have been used for grazing. Uh, the property model here, we, we went for about 8,700 hectares, which we felt was typical of the region, running about 1,500 adult equivalent, a breeding herd turning off steers. Uh, our target market for this one was feed on steers off buffalo grass, which quite a few people seem to be doing, and we've done a fair bit of work and think that's just as profitable as anything else, so that's a good starting point. And for our reproduction efficiency within the cow herd that we built the model around, we use the cash cow project central forest median reproduction efficiency. Now, what strategies did we look at to build profit and resilience for this Fitzroy region? We looked at a group of strategies that were aimed at improving steer performance, like uh, planting legume grass pastures on some of these better soils, uh, forage oats, uh, forage crops such as oats. Uh, we also looked at fried sorghum, but we don't report that here. Things like custom feedlotting, sending your steers off to be fed, hormone growth promotants. We looked at a few marketing options like organic beef, European steers, targeting Wagyu beef. We looked at things to improve breeder herd performance alone. So we looked at the performance of the breeder herd, better genetics to improve fertility in that herd, investing to reduce fetal calf loss. Pestivirus management was a topic that came up that people wanted to look at. Uh, phosphorus supplementation was one that people uh, wanted to look at and supplementing first calf heifers to, re to improve reconception rates. So they are the topics we looked at. Now we're going to present a lot of data and most of it's going to come in this form where we've got a table with options and strategies down the left hand side here and we're going to uh, report four measures of that, that sort of give you an idea of the extra profit that these uh, strategy might add to this business and, and the sort of extra debt or extra cash that you've got to outlay to get into it, the year that that deficit occurs and the payback period. Now, let's just look at how these things are calculated because a little bit of economics in this and it's not that straightforward. The first thing we do is actually build a model of this base property. And because a lot of these strategies take a long time to implement and the, the investment lasts for a, uh, a long time, we picked a 30 year investment period for the, for the property. So for, for every base model we did in each region, um, we, we worked out how much money would it, we would have to invest to get into the property to buy the cattle, the plant and equipment, the land. And then over the 30 years, what on average would we earn in terms of income? And then at the end of the 30 years, we sold the property um, and the cattle and, and residual plant at the depreciated value. And then from that, we got a, a, an idea of the profitability of that enterprise. And you can see here that we calculated the thing called the net present value, which is all these incomes and expenses, the negatives and the positives, all discounted back to this starting investment. So we said, right, if you went out and bought this property for that amount of money, earned that income, and then sold at the end of 30 years, you would in effect, have a, a, re, a rate of return on your capital of, of less than 2%. And if you had an alternative 
investment that you could earn 5% before tax somewhere else, you were about $3.5 million better off by taking that alternative investment. So this property, it's obviously an investment of resources to achieve the goals of the investor. And if the goal of the investor is to be a beef cattle producer, they're not really interested in these sums here. They're more interested in how can we improve that. This discount rate it represents the time value of money. So something out here is worth less you, to you than something up here. So we discount things to represent that. So looking at this total return, it's interesting, but it's not that helpful. And the goal is always to see, okay, that's where we, that's what we've got. That's what we think can happen. How do we make it better? The next step for each change, we built the alternative model. So we built, let's, and this example is just looking at Lakina. So in the first year, we clear out a few steers and we get a little bit extra income. Then we plant the Lakina and have some expenses. And then over time, we have income and expenses that are built up because of the Lakina investment or any other investment we look at in this process. So again, we can discount that and come up with a rate of return. Um, and when, when you look at it as a discrete whole farm investment, like it doesn't tell you a lot. It says, oh, well, we think it might be a bit better, but we don't know why. So it's necessary to look at the difference between the two strategies over time to look at the impact of change. That's how we do it. We looked at them. We look at the marginal, the, the, the difference between the two over time. So the sum is basically, let's, let's think about one possible future, which is the property with Lakina. And let's look at the pot, another possible future, which is let's keep the property as it is and continue on into the future. So that one minus that one gives us a difference. So in each year, we calculate what is the difference in terms of capital invested, cattle, livestock value, change in income. And now in this, there's a few key concepts of, uh, of, 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 that we apply. One's opportunity cost. We won't define that here. Time value of money is important because an income out here isn't worth as much to as an income here because of risk and, and the opportunity cost of holding that for, off for that income and the principle of marginality, this idea that you can look at things at the edge and get a better idea of what's going on than looking at the whole farm in a discrete process. So this idea of calculating this present value, the marginal net present value, what we do is we take each one of these incomes and we discount it at the opportunity cost back to what it would be worth now. So they all come back to the starting point. And you can see in the case of this Lakina investment, we're saying if you uh, opened up, optimised Lakina on this property, planted enough to put all your steers on from weaning and, and had a big expense up front where you went out and paid for the Lakina planting and then a couple of more years of low income and then you built up and then you've got to maintain the Lakina over time. When you discount each one of those years back to the current value, you say, well, that would improve the profitability of my property in a present value of $620,000. I would be that much better off if that investment worked out as I expected. And the re marginal return on the investment of the capital flows here is about 33%. So that's better than our 5%. So it's a positive marginal net present value. So that those numbers don't mean a lot to, to, to non-economists. So we try and, and bring them back to an annual value. So we convert that marginal figure to an annual return. So it's, it's an identical value to the marginal one. We just say this is what it's worth per annum on average. So our $620,000 becomes about 40 grand. So we're saying the Lakina in this enterprise, if everything goes well, will add about 40 grand a year to profit. So that tells us how ex much extra profit we have. Uh, but we also want to think about some of the other risks involved in these investments because they take time to implement and it's a long time before you get the extra money. So we want to look at, think about how much extra money are we going to have to outlay compared to not changing? So that's the peak deficit. And you can see in this case, this is our summary page for, that we do for each investment, the total improvement of change versus do nothing. That's the difference between the two strategies over time. You can see in the second year, we, we're out, we spend $208,000, but in the year before that, we get 128 extra from selling down our steers to give us a bit of space to plant the Lakina. And you can see when we compare the two and we accumulate them, have a cumulative balance, we get a plus 128 minus that, minus that, 
and we finally get to our maximum minus, which is in year four, that's our peak deficit. So it's gonna take us four years before our bank balance starts to turn around. And then when we keep accumulating that with interest, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years before the, the money becomes positive, the difference becomes positive. So there's a seven year payback period and Okay, and, and that's the eighth year when it's positive, but there's seven years before it's paid back. So these are our summary numbers. So when we present them, we present for Lakina something like, okay, if you optimise the investment in Lakina, and each one is optimised for the property to test whether the endpoint is worth achieving. So we don't go out and plant 10 hectares of Lakina, we go out and plant enough for the steers and we pretend it's going to work. Um, we think about all the risks later and so, we, we say, righto, if you optimise it, it's about 40 grand a year on extra on average, but it doesn't work on average. There's a peak deficit of 145,000, and year four before you get there, and a payback year to a period of seven years. We also looked at, okay, because there's a need to restructure the herd and build up the breeder numbers on the property, we actually thought, well, let's go out and buy some extra breeders to get the number of steers going on to Lakina, optimise it completely. And we found that building up your breeders through purchases did actually improve your average profitability because you got to use the Lakina fully more sooner. But you get a higher peak deficit and about the same payback period. We also looked at an alternative that's a, a new, newly researched um, form of um, uh, legume, the small seeded legumes. We used Desmanthus here as an example. We took the steers through to the feed on weight. So we put them on Desmanthus at weaning and took them through the feed on weight. And we looked at the costs and returns of that. And on the same quality country that you would put this Lakina on and get those returns, your returns are probably going to be a little bit behind Lakina, but it's not as expensive to get into it. And, but you do have a bit longer payback period because there's a little bit more spelling and stuff going on here. So that's the process we applied. We went on to look at things like forage oats. In this case, we targeted putting the steers on forage oats so they were sold off oats at a feed on weight. We've looked at a number of strategies for forage oats at different weights and different strategies. We can't make it pay in this environment. And, and most of these returns for forage oats, this just means that it never, because it's negative, it never pays back. Uh, we couldn't make forage oats, adding forage oats into the growth paths of steers work in this environment. The same for feedlotting steers, we're producing feed on steers that would be sent to a feedlot by somebody else. So what about us just sending them to the feedlot and selling them as finished steers out of the feedlot? Well, we did that and we got the prices uh, for feedlot steers over the same period and we couldn't make that work. Our parameters for the, the, the weight gain and the costs and everything in the Feedlot were the same as Beef Central puts up on its uh, website on a regular basis, so a, a pretty well accepted industry figures for what steers will do. Uh, now, we also looked at, uh, let's stick a HGP into these steers um, and, and from weaning so that they turn off at, a, at they, they have a higher weight gain over time, they use feed a little bit more efficiently. Did the economics of that and it came up that if you could sell them at that heavier weight at the same age, at your normal turnoff age at the same weight, and get the same price as you expected, it was more profitable to put the HGP in them. And it was a quick payback period. But if you went over the weight scale and you lost 10 cents a kilo in, that, in your average price, it was only a break even proposition and you probably wouldn't do it. So very sensitive to getting the cattle into the right um, market area. So then we thought, okay, let's sell them at the same weight and get the same price um, as, as originally as they do as a feed on weight. Um, so that they go off younger at, all, at, at, at the same price. And what we found then was over time, you actually restructure the herd to have more breeders in the herd and it reduces the profitability of a whole enterprise, which was an interesting outcome. So HGPs, uh, you've got to really think about the target market and, and the price premium or deficit that you get by changing your operation. We went on and looked at a few marketing operations. We, uh, we don't have a lot of information on organic beef and the people we talked to were getting into organics. Um, so we took their information and basically worked out that 
there is a price premium over the last few years. Um, and but to get that on the on our example property on our uh, example herd, we had to run less adult equivalents because we're getting rid of supplements and we were making sure that we didn't have a drought risk by running the same number of cattle. So on that basis, it wasn't all that much more profitable. Now a lot of organic beef producers will have a different scenario to that, but we couldn't really make it um, pop up as something really uh, tremendous. We looked also at marketing to the EU steers and we looked at our same um, steers. We got them accredited to the EU market over, it took a couple of years to do that. Uh, we gave them a 15 cent a kilo um, at the same age. We took the lead of the steers off and slaughtered them and we took the tail off at the same point in time and sold them as feed on. And we added a little bit to the profit of the business. Um, we thought that's not real flash, so we'll look at feed on only. And we sold them at, at, at two ages, uh, a little bit younger in two cohorts, about the same profitability. So that wasn't all that tremendous either. Um, and then we thought, okay, this premium price here is fairly important. What if we halve it and we drop it from 15 cents a kilo extra to seven and a half, and you can see it's unprofitable. So it's very sensitive to the price premium you get. We looked at Wagyu beef. Um, we looked what we thought might happen in the future. We very hard to get prices for Wagyu because they they changed significantly over the last couple of years. But we we talked to people who are in Wagyu and were looking forward. So we converted our Brahmin cross herd to Wagyu over a number of years. And once we got to producing Wagyu steers and 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 cattle, if that price premium was maintained and it was 100% price above what we were getting for our Brahma Cross steers, it was quite profitable to do that investment. It had a fairly lengthy payback period, but it was added quite to profit. Now, if that premium reduced from year 20, so from 20 years after we started, the premium reduced over six years back to just the Brahma Cross price, it was marginally profitable, but had a very long payback period, so it wasn't a real flash investment. And if you, if you start to convert to Wagyu beef now, and that premium price reduces from year 10 over the next six years back to no better than what you're getting now, it's unprofitable. So the price premium is really important there. When we looked at just separating out the breeder herd on this property uh, and looking at breeder performance alone, the first thing we looked at that people wanted to look at was let's improve the fertility of the cow herd by 6%. Now we did that by basically swapping out the current bull herd um, at buying them back at the same price, but of course some of the old bulls that we've got there at the moment are not worth as much as some of the new bulls. So there's a little bit of capital we had to put out, and then we bought those genes through the herd over time. We got the heifers and then remated them and built up the numbers over time. And because of the current performance and the diminishing returns that are associated with changing the current level performance of this herd, we couldn't make that investment work in this region. Uh, when we look, we also thought, okay, uh, fetal calf loss in these herds in Northern Australia is, is a problem. Um, and, and we looked at, for this region alone, um, in the first and second calving groups, what, how much money could we spend to reduce that loss by 50%? So the, the, ca the cash cow uh, median level of calf loss for this region was used in the model. And we reduced that by 50% in the first and second carving groups. So, and we decided, well, we can spend an amount of money per retained heifer per annum, or we can spend money up front and get a 50% reduction in carving loss. And you can see, no matter how, it's very sensitive to the amount of money you spend because the calf loss figures are not that great, not huge in this region, uh, according to the cash cow data. So there's not a lot of room to move there in reducing calf loss. We looked at pestivirus, which um, is a very uh, difficult topic to get a, 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 around, but we looked at the latest reports we could get to the impact of pestivirus in the north, and we, and we said, righto, let's have a herd where the, it's got high prevalence pestivirus and suffers the impacts that uh, the reports, various reports say they suffer, and let's vaccinate everything and get rid of pestivirus. Now, that was basically a break-even proposition with a long payback period. Another strategy was just to vaccinate the heifers, and we pretended in this, if we vaccinated the heifers, we'd get the same response as if we vaccinated everything. Um, 
that improved the returns a little bit, but you've got to believe that you're going to get the same response as vaccinating everything as you will in the heifers, because there will be cows with pestivirus and in going forward into the herd for some time. So, but still, even so, it's still not a spectacular uh, amount of extra profit. We looked at, let's pretend the herd is naive, that it doesn't have pestivirus. We looked at the risks and the, and the unknowns in getting a naive herd exposed to pestivirus and the risks uh, and the losses associated with that. And because we couldn't really predict when that loss would happen, we couldn't make a positive result out of that. And that's a bit tricky um, because uh, if you've got a naive herd and you, and you get pestivirus next year at the wrong time, the losses are tremendous. But not being able to predict when those losses might happen makes it difficult to predict an economic response from vaccinating a naive herd. Um, and we, we talk about some of the experiences up in the, in the north about how that can be managed in the, in the document. We also looked at the first calf heifers. So they've had a calf. Sometimes they're difficult to get back into calf. Um, and we, we couldn't make that pay, but putting their weight up a bit higher so they conceived more. And wet season spelling just for breeders, based on some research that was done out around Emerald over the last decade or so, um, it was difficult to show that that was a break-even proposition because you're only changing the breeding herd performance a little bit. When you change the breeding herd performance, you sort of uh, affect other parts of the herd as well. We had a, a lot of people are very interested in phosphorus. And, and we looked at the phosphorus status of breeder herds in the Fitzroy. Uh, a bit tricky because our median herd doesn't, obviously, because of the, the performance we've got for the median herd, obviously doesn't run on phosphorus deficient country. So we, we had to do a bit of thinking about if you've got phosphorus de deficient country with these levels of soil P and, and running at these levels, anything better than adequate, obviously, is not phosphorus deficient. Um, how do we build models for that? So to look at the impact of different levels of phosphorus status on, on our breeder herd, um, what we had to do, we had to describe the performance of a breeder herd running on land with each level of P status, so each one of these levels of P status. So this is no longer the median herd. We described the change in performance for breeder mortality, breeder live weight, sale weight for cows, weaning rate, uh, when various P supplementation regimes were applied. We started with the herd in the pre-supplementation state. We provided the supplement and then allowed the herd to adjust over time. Herds with acute, deficient and marginal P status do not achieve what you'd expect an adequate because a herd would do because there's always something else going on in this country other than P deficiency. And we didn't expect them, if we fixed up the P status of their diet, that they would get back to an adequate herd. They would, would come up closer to, to um, uh, but they wouldn't get there. So. Then we also said, everything's done over a 30 year investment time frame. Let's put the P supplementation program in place and see what the benefits would be over 30 years to compare them to our other investments. Now in this case, in CQ, we took the weaners off the um, breeder block that was a, had one of these states of P deficiency um, and we transferred them back to a Brigolo block that wasn't P deficient. So they all compensated for the differences in weaning weight uh, by the time of sale. So we only looked at, at the impact of pea supplements on breeder herd performance in the Fitzroy. We looked at um, impact on other classes of cattle in the other regions. So we ended up with 12 treatments. We ended up with uh, a property that had run, running breeders on marginal country and we supplemented them in the wet season only with pea, a pea supplement. We supplemented them in the dry season with N and P together or we supplemented them in the dry season with N and P and the wet season with P. So they were our supplementation regimes. And you can see we worked out the cost of those supplementation regimes. So, and then in deficient, we had a different mob of cows with a different level of performance and different responses to each of these uh, strategies and different costs of supplement because you've got different levels of P in the diet and different diets. And then on the acute country, um, uh, we, decided, we we costed our diets for each one of those strategies as well, or, or supplements. So a quick look at the uh, economics. When we were on this marginal country that was just below the um, uh, viable limit for, for P status, and there was an effect on cow performance, when we supplemented in the wet season alone, we got quite a, a sound economic benefit and a very high 
um, efficiency of use of capital. Uh, when we looked at putting uh, a supplement that was just in the dry season into these cows, was marginal um, with a fairly long payback period, it's still profitable, uh, but we didn't include any costs of putting the supplement out in this exercise. So if you had to spend money to put the supplement out, it would probably negate that. And when we supplemented in both the dry and the wet, it's phosphorus and nitrogen supplements in the dry and P in the wet, uh, basically, now this is an anomaly of the, of the small number of cattle in the, in the, that change their weight and the, and, and, and the small benefits. So there's a very long payback period there, it's just hidden by this small profit figure. But still, uh, each one of those is profitable. One's a bit more efficient than the other. When we looked at the deficient herd, and we got um, a, a lot better response because we're getting a much bigger improvement in the performance of the cow herd. Um, this cow herd's probably not as profitable as this one, but the response, the extra profit of treating these deficient herds is is quite good. Again, the wet season only was the most efficient use of capital. This is still profitable. You get 463% return on your capital over the 30 years but you get a thousand there, so that's much more efficient. Um, there's a bit more of a peak deficit. So, but there's, there's very little difference between those two except the efficiency of cap. When you go to the acute herd, you significantly improve the performance of the breeding herd, less mortalities, uh, uh, better calving rates, uh, better sale weights. Again, the wet season P only looked like the most economic way to do things, even though this is a significant improvement in profit. So there's, there's quite a bit to digest there. So after all this thinking and, and talking and working with people to come up with this, what are the insights? Or what do we, what do we learn from this exercise for the Fitzroy? The first thing when we presented this to uh, beef producers was that they said, well, you're not giving us much. There's no, you're, not, you're not showing ways that we can move forward quickly. Um, but you've got, to, you've got to remember that the beef performance system we've got here in, in the Fitzroy is quite well sorted. These are pretty smart managers who are doing pretty good things. And when you look at the performance of their, their cattle, it's pretty well sorted. So we couldn't find much to offer them. So this means because they're getting fairly solid performance out of their breeders already, that reduces the potential for improving the breeder herd performance. And most of this is due to the, the lengthy period that these strategies take to, to be implemented or diminishing returns from shifting the herd models only slightly and, and, and not getting a lot of extra money. Perennial legumes look okay. Um, and what we say to people is, uh, you, there's, future, there's going to be opportunities in the future, you've got to look for them. And the example of this is 20 years ago, if the people who moved to Wagyu jeans 20 years ago, they increased the cost of production, reduced herd productivity, but those who did it well have, have been quite profitable from that from that uh, thing. So opportunities are, are where you find them. A quick look at the Catherine region. This is the region we're looking at here. Very large region, includes the Victoria River, the Sturt Plateau, a bit of the Ropa, the Gulf, none of the Barclay. So we looked at the uh, Bureau of Statistics data and the Northern Territory Pastoral Industry Survey data for this region. The average property size up there is about 147,000 hectares, runs about eight, nearly 9,000 meat cattle. So our base property model up here is 147,000 hectares, running 7,400 AE. Our target is live export steers off native pastures. Again, we use the cash cow project northern forest median reproduction efficiency to, the, to build the herd model. We also use the median rates of mortality from the breeder cow mortality project, which was a survey um, a, done up here of mortality rates um, and, and came up with some really interesting stuff. So that was how we built our model. The, the strategies that we looked at up there, again, we looked at steer performance, stylos, mortality rates, uh, feeding concentrates to the steer tail to get rid of them, flood adjustment on the floodplain. We looked at pea supplements, herd segregation and, and breed your own bulls for the whole herd performance. And with the breeders, we looked at genetics, reducing calf loss, fetal calf loss, feeding heifers to, to improve their conception rates, which are very low up in this region, uh, looking at our female culling strategy and, and breeder mortality rates. So we don't have any strategies that we could identify that specifically said, if you do this, you reduce your mortality rates in steers. And the survey of mortality rates undertaken up there showed that the steer mortality rates were quite high. 
So we thought, well, how much money can you spend on this property and reduce to reduce your mortality in your steers by 50% and still add to profitability? And you can see $10 a head per annum spent just on the steers um, will, will improve your profitability. Um, not by, this is a bigger property, so this is, you know, it's an amount of money, but it's not huge. Um, spending money up front, how much can you spend up front to reduce mortality in steers by 50%? And you can see, you can spend a, 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 a sizable amount of capital on this property if you reduce your mortality rate by 50% on average for the next 30 years. And you can see that um, yeah, there's a little bit to think about there in mortality rate of steers. We looked at stylos on some of the red soils on the Sturt Plateau. We looked at um, establishing stylos um, and augmenting the pastures that were there already, putting in a bit of fencing and watering, uh, making sure the system had the right spells to get the stylo going. We had a, a, a utilisation rate recommend, recommended for that land type. And we came up with a fairly long payback period, but added to profit and, and a significant peak deficit. So there's a lot of money to spend to get stylos established. We thought, okay, let's up the utilisation rate a little bit because there's a lot of history of people utilising these at a hot, slightly higher rate. So increasing the utilisation rate um, by 30% in this case, uh, in, in, it almost doubled the profit and didn't short the payback period. We looked at history and we said, uh, there's a review done by Miller and Stockwell back in the 90s. They effectively uh, talked about a 40% utilisation rate in their analysis. Uh, which significantly improved the profitability. So uh, we don't know what the right utilisation rate is. We don't know what the correct management is to get the best utilisation out of these style of augmented pastures, but there's profit in there if it's done the right way. Feeding the steer concentrates, we looked at pulling off the steers that were that normally held for an extra wet season because they're too light to go on the boat, putting them on concentrates for a while, getting their weight up and getting rid of them at the same time as the lead steers. Uh, no matter how we did that, we couldn't make that work. The, the concentrate that was coming out of Kununurra was just too expensive to make that work. Um, then we thought, okay, there's a few floodplains and you can put cattle on the floodplains for the dry season, the early part of the wet. We firstly looked at putting just the tail of the steers, the ones that were held over an extra 12 months on the floodplains, getting rid of them in the same year. That added a little bit of, to profitability. There weren't a lot of steers in that tail. Then we thought, okay, if, it, if that's profitable, what if we put all the steers on the floodplain? pay an adjustment fee, um, put extra weight on them and then sell them at the same price, very profitable, but we, there's not a lot of research and data behind that. So that's something to think about. When we looked at uh, improving the genetics, the weaning rate by 6% over time in this herd, because it has a lower starting point for its uh, fertility, its performance, uh, we, we could show that that was profitable to do that, to think about that has a significant peak deficit and has a very long payback period. So it's 15 years before you get back to where you would have been if you hadn't invested um, or changed your, your strategy there. Um, reducing fetal calf loss, again, uh, calf loss figures are very high, um, shown to be so in the, in, the, in the cash care data. And you can see that spending $10 a head doesn't really, and this is in all the retained females. So in this case, it's all the, females that are mated and retained in the herd. It's not just the young ones, so it's every class of females. And you can see that um, it, 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 you run out of being able to spend money fairly quickly. And spending capital up front, doesn't matter, we don't know whether that's fences or yards or waters or something, but if you spent an amount of money and could reduce your calf loss by 50%, well, you can see there's profit there, but you've got to spend a fair bit of money and there's a fairly long payback period on some of these things. We looked at mortality rates in breeders, and in this case, we said, what if we could spend 10 bucks per head of retained breeders and reduce mortality in the breeders by 50%? Now that, for each dollar spent there, you get a $10 return compared to there. So spend $10 a head, get two and a half. Spend $10 a head, get 20, uh, 28, which is about a tenfold increase. So there's something in, um, the median mortality rates in breeders that is fairly important economically and thinking about doing something about mortality rates in breeders is, is could be a fairly high priority if you have a high mortality rate in your breeders. And, and the survey data suggests that there are properties there that do. Uh, mortality rates in breeders, spending capital up front, you can see you can spend a significant amount of capital up front 
and get a fairly significant improvement in profit as long as you can re reduce your mortality rate by 50%. Feeding first calf heifers, some uh, really good work, feeding trial work done by Tim Schatz at Kidman Springs Research Station. Lovely trial, but um, when you look at the results, we couldn't make it an economic proposition. Uh, get good responses and you get more calves, but the costs are greater than the benefits. We then, we looked over time at different uh, ways of culling the heifers at different ages, before and after mating, over mating, things like that. And there's, there's, if you, they're, they're just sorting out the herd, there could be money in that. Improving the herd performance, looking across the total herd and saying, what can we do across everything to make this more profitable? So for the Catherine region, uh, there's a really good trial going on at the moment on the Kidman Springs Research Station looking at uh, phosphorus supplementation. It's feeding phosphorus in the dry and the wet and it's on, on land that is uh, acutely deficient in pea. So what we did, we, we built a herd that mimicked the performance of what we expected a herd to do on acute pea, a phosphorus country up in that in the Kidman Springs area or that Catherine area, um, and used the, the data out of Tim's trial and some of the response functions and data out of the phosphorus book uh, to build that herd. And then we, we put in place the supplementation program that, that Tim's got in place and compared the economics of those two herds over 30 years. And we got a massive benefit um, in getting a pea into a cattle on acutely deficient country it provided a massive benefit, which was really interesting. Then we looked at uh, something that's been around for a few years now, this idea of segregating the herd into groups based on um, fetal aging. Uh, we don't know how much money, this varies property to property. Uh, we don't know how much money you've got to spend up front to do this, so we tested it at a different number of uh, levels of capital expenditure. And you can sp see if you get the benefits that um, we identified for herd segregation, um, that there, there can be significant economic benefits in getting that herd management right. And, and the strategies vary from property to property and there's a, you, you've got to learn this from somebody who does it well. Uh, but there seems to be quite a bit in that when you come to think about it on some of these properties with uncontrolled mating. Um, and uh, the, the last thing we looked at up there was what if we put aside, um, selected some cows on objective performance and then selected bulls out of those cows on um, objective performance. We actually could increase the profitability of the property significantly over time with a low payback period. So that was a bit of a challenge. Um, on the basis that our herd performance didn't fall because we were selecting our own bulls. Um, and if you select on objective measures, that is probably a low risk. Um, what did we learn from doing all those numbers and, and putting those models together? Basically, these are bigger properties, but they have a, a generally have a low output per unit area. And because of that, and because of their long history of being where they are, their development is really has been really constrained by the availability of capital. It's, it's prevented a lot of things happening. We looked at a lot of investments for these properties and we can we showed that you can significantly add to the profit of these businesses if you go about it the right way. And this is even at the long-term beef prices applied in this analysis, not at the prices that, that uh, have been up there over the last three or four years. So even at the long-term prices, there are things there that can significantly improve, uh, add to the profit of these businesses. And some of the things that we were looking at you can get an upwards of 20% per annum marginal return on extra capital invested, which is which is really interesting. And we found that the key strategies to consider for investment are those that efficiently reduce mortality rates, that's the first priority, where they are high and or efficiently improve steer nutrition. These are the first two places where you go to look for these investments. Now, our last region that we want to look at, the North Queensland Gulf region, um, just west of Cairns here, all the catchments that run out into the Gulf. So all the, all these catchments up here run out into the Gulf. It's a natural resource management region. We're looking at um, strategies in that area there. So our property in this case was 30,000 hectares, which is sort of a, a small to typical size for the properties in that region. It runs about 1,500 adult equivalents with uh, breeders and steers. Our target is live export steers off native pastures. And again, we used the median cash cow northern forest reproduction efficiency to build our herd model. Now, when we talk to the people in this region, one of the things that the people, the scientists and the land managers up there are really 
concerned about is the decline in land condition that they've seen over recent decades. And coupled with that is they don't feel that uh, phosphorus supplementation is, is really right where it should be. So the first two things that they wanted to look at were this, they've measured this decline in land condition since 2004 up to 2016. So we've got high value country declining at that rate and lower value grazing country declining at that rate. And this uh, from 74% of the original compact carrying capacity down to about uh, high 60s. And this one is from a bit over 70% down to around about 60 something percent. And, and that decline has been measured um, and, it, and it's, and it's a, a real challenge for the people up there who are looking at these beef production systems. So our, our example property, we actually put that in the model. We assessed it as starting off with 40 to 60% more cattle than it probably should have at its long-term carrying capacity. And we said, if you maintain this stocking rate, we will continue this decline over the next 30 years. So we, this was our rate of decline from, for the next 30 years. We went from 65% down to 50% of our carrying capacity over time. And uh, we, we built budgets with and without that in place. So to restore land condition, we built a budget with the same breeders being held over time, but the performance of that breeding herd falling off due to the fall in land condition. So we, we maintained the same breeders, but reduced uh, growth rates, increased mortality rates, reduced uh, uh, herd performance, but only, you can see here, it only the number of weaners produced over time only falls off gradually. The other thing we did to restore land condition was dramatically reduce the number of adult equivalents by uh, 40 or 50% um, in the first year and then let the pastures um, improve over time and then slowly come back up as the carrying capacity improved. So you can see the two strategies compared are, let's just go ahead and, and suffer the decline and suffer the fall off in animal production or reduce the numbers, try to improve our pastures over time and, 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 and come back to a long-term carrying capacity. So when you did the cash flows for those over 30 years, you can see you, you sold the cattle and got some cash in the bank, uh, but it took, and it took you nine years to more or less come back into a deficit. But over 30 years, there's very little difference. And, and so just restoring land condition by itself um, wasn't gonna make this property viable. So we needed to, do, to add something. So then we added uh, adequate phosphorus. So we fixed up the phosphorus diet over the wet season and got a performance improvement out of the breeding herd due to that. So when we put those two together, you can see we still sold our herd down. We've actually got a few less breeders because they're a bit bigger, uh, because they're now on a phosphorus supplementation diet, so we can run less of them at the same adult equivalent rating, and then they build up over time. And because our herd fertility is improved because of the phosphorus supplementation program, we get a few more weaners out of the system. So we've got a better system. We've got a few more costs with phosphorus and things like that. You can see that you know, we sell our cattle down, but over the 30 years, the track for that property is not that encouraging either. So after we looked at these things, we thought, okay, for a resting land condition decline alone, yes, it improves profitability, but not sufficient to make the property resilient to survive over the longer term. When we fixed up our pea supplementation um, and, and had land condition restoration underway, we got a significant improvement in profit, but put this as that and the P, it still was probably not sufficient to allow this property to survive over the longer term, even though that's a significant improvement in profitability. So what else can we do? What are the additional strategies that we've got to build profit and resilience in this North Queensland Gulf area? We looked at improving steer performance, uh, a number of strategies there, feeding molasses, stylos, lacina, silage, selling steers one year older, putting steers on adjustment on the downs so that they go there as weaners. Uh, breeder performance, genetics, fetal calf loss, supplementation again, and herd performance, we just looked at BEO bulls because we've already done the phosphorus improvement in the, in the base herd. So this is, all these strategies are compared to that new base herd where we're fixing up land condition and we've got phosphorus about right. So this, the, all these strategies are compared to that. Can we improve that? When we looked at feeding uh, molasses to the steers to get them off uh, sooner or at a heavier weight, we couldn't make that work. Uh, when we plant, looked at planting stylos, um, similar to 
the sort of system we were looking at in the Northern Territory, um, we, we looked at um, a lower utilisation rate and, and the stylos um, are doing a little bit for our grass, but not a lot. And we, we, it's profitable, but there's a very big peak deficit and a long payback period. When we looked at, let's say the stylo has a better effect on grass production than we sort of think it might, well, they improve profitability, but we've still got a fairly long payback period. We looked at Lakina on different land types in the Gulf, and unfortunately, we had to use the old uh, estimates of, of cost and returns for Lakina, and it's only a break-even proposition, and we hope that, that a bit of research that's going on up there at the moment might improve those numbers, but the Lakina under the old system is not very flash. Uh, growing some uh, growing and using silage, producing it on the farm, feeding it to steers to get steers off younger, not economic. Turning off steers one year older, restructuring the herd to go to an older age group um, was an interesting proposition. And, and at the average prices over the last decade, it was probably better to turn off steers older than we were targeting. Uh, and adjusting steers on the downs, where we restructured, the, we sent the steers to the downs put them on the Downs country as wieners and sold them as, as uh, f um, export steers. Um, we restructured the herd and that, that did, didn't come up as profitable. So that is, is an interesting one as well. Genetics, better genetics for fertility. So again, 6% improvement in weaning rate over the um, period of time that it takes to readjust this herd, uh, probably 10 to 13 years, depending on your assumptions. Marginally profitable, fairly significant peak deficit and a very long payback period. Reducing fetal calf loss, similar sort of responses to what we got in the Northern Territory because we're using the same level of uh, reduction in calf loss and we've got the same starting values from the cash cow project and you can see uh, there's a little bit of extra profit in there if you could come up with a strategy to reduce calf loss in this region. So um, if you can spend $10 a head, you probably would worry about it. But if you could get a 50% loss a 50% reduction in calf loss across your breeder herd for $5 a head, it's probably worth thinking about. Uh, again, spending capital up front, um, if you could spend $75,000 and reduce your calf loss by 50%, well, it's positive. Feeding first calf heifers, we couldn't get that to work in any region. The interesting one that popped up here was when we looked at the survey data for what these people pay for their bulls, and we put in place this model of breeding their own bulls, we actually improved the profitability of the property quite significantly and probably better than just about anything else other than phosphorus we could come up with. Um, insights from the analysis of the, of the North Queensland Gulf. This is a property that performs similarly to the Catherine region, but suffers um, because the, the properties are generally smaller in size and because of their history, they've got problems. And Addressing the land condition decline and pea supplementation significantly Im improved the relative profitability, but I, I appear unlikely to make this property sufficiently resilient for, to survive, which, which you know, is a bit of an issue. Uh, even so, it is critical that these two issues are addressed. You've got to get that right before you do anything else. And then the remaining question that we, we're asking is, are there additional strategies that can be found to make the property more viable? And we think there are combinations there that will probably get this property to a point where it, it can survive. Let's look across the whole sweep of what we looked across Northern Australia, uh, trying to make a big picture assumptions here. Now the key insight from the analyses that we've done to date is that where a profitable beef production system is already in place, it's difficult to find production strategies that will dramatically improve the profit and reduce the riskiness of the system. So there's a, quite a few things out there where we say, look, this is significant improvement in profit, but riskiness, that those long payback periods, those big peak deficits, make that system more risky. So it's pretty hard to find something that's going to do both, but they're probably there. So this finding is independent of the current performance level of the beef production system. So if somebody's got their property really well worked out and they've, they've got a system in place that's profitable. Independent of their current performance level, it's difficult to find something that will improve them. In many cases, it's the increased risk associated with change. It's more critical of the determinant of, of outcomes than increased profits. So that's the thing that the front of a lot of people's mind when they're looking at these strategies. So 
But we still think there's priorities. The first priority we think are strategies that target overall herd performance in the north. The key is pea supplementation when appropriate. That, that, that is just a no-brainer. Um, you've got to work out the pea status of the herd and whether you've, you're adequately supplying pea. There's a lot of pea deficient country out there and, and we think there's, there's, quite a, there's large benefits in getting that right or making sure it's right. Um, we'll have follow-up webinars on, on this topic coming up in the next couple of months, so you can wait around for them, but, and, and there'll be a lot of good information in those webinars on, on getting pea supplementation right. Herd segregation is a bit of a challenge for some people, but this is a strategy underpinned by fetal ageing um, and the combination of other things that are relevant to particular property. So it's a property specific um, strategy. Um, and it may require significant investment of cattle. It's worth looking at where there's continuous mating um, and, and you think it, it, uh, that better management's gonna help. Now, all these things are underpinned by reducing mortality rates in steers and female stock. Um, when we looked at, pull these models apart and we say, well, what's doing it for us in terms of economic improvement? Is it mortality rates or growth rates or reproduction efficiency? The change in mortality rates in these in these median mortality rates underpins an improvement in profit in this northern region. And you've got to remember that arresting land condition decline is a prerequisite for resilience. It's not going to add a lot. We don't know whether it's going to add a lot to profitability in the short to medium term, but it's just a prerequisite. It's, it's not a choice. And the interesting thing that popped out to us was how do you get this breed your own bulls um, economics done a little bit better. But uh, there's an interesting um, concepts in behind that and people with the right set of skills uh, might be able to make their businesses more uh, profitable by breeding their own bulls. The second priority that we can see across Northern Australia is this improvement in steer nutrition with perennial legumes. Um, the next thing that you, know, you think we think you should be really looking about, um, we know that Lakeen is a clear winner in the Fitzroy when it's established and managed appropriately. The small seeded legumes like Katinga, Stylo and Desmanthus may have an important role in more favoured regions. Augmenting pastures with Stylos for steers look worthy of revisiting. We, there's, there is a real need to clarify pasture establishment, pasture utilisation and nutrition for Stylos when you're augmenting pastures. So we, we, we think it's profitable, but we're not sure. Now, lack of research data for Lakina in the far north inhibits the value proposition there, so we can't say any more than that. And when you think about some of these other regions, uh, like the Mitchell grasslands and the northern downs of, of Queensland, when we've done a little bit of analysis there, well, buying a Lekina property in, in CQ and transferring all the steers at Wieners could be attractive but risky. So thinking outside the square for some of these regions um, um, might be an insight. Now, the final insights here, investing in the breeder herd in isolation. We couldn't significantly improve business profit and resilience by just isolating out the breeder herd and investing in that. The obvious exception is pea supplementation and herd segregation when appropriate. So we couldn't find a lot to invest, but there are things that you need to do anyway. These are prerequisites, they're not really investments. So you need to implement low cost strategies that aid resilience, you need to look after your body condition, you need to think about herd structure, female cull age, age of steer turn off. Now, when we do the second part two webinar, we're going to be looking at these strategies and these low cost strategies that aid resilience. So when we go on to the second uh, uh, webinar next week, we're going to look at low cost strategies to build resilience of beef production in Northern Australia. So we're not looking particularly at investments, we're looking at things you've just got to get right. And that's breeder condition. And we're going to look at the relationship between breeder condition and, and rates of mortality. Female cull age, this affects herd profit and herd resilience, and the age of steer turn off. This affects numbers of breeders in the herd. We're going to look at those as topics. So some of the stuff we're going to cover next week is, for example, why didn't the GISMET exercise in the North Queensland Gulf property reduce profit, while the GISMET exercise for the Catherine property have the opposite impact? And this is to do with these things here. And why was selling steers one year older more profitable in the North Queensland Gulf? So they, they're the sort of questions we're going to look at next week. Um, this overarching idea of how do you assess these strategies? So there's numerous strategies and new technology arriving all the time. Every time you open 
any of the rural magazines, here's a new something that you can think about. The challenge in all this is to identify the ones that make your beef production system more efficient or more profitable. Um, so to do this, we had to develop a clear understanding of the current pro production system. And to do that, we needed access to both the experienced property managers, which were our case studies, and relevant R&D results, which is our lengthy discussions with the science people and the development people. We put all that knowledge and skill into a framework, into an appropriate framework, um, and then we looked at the reasoning behind that process and, and applying all those models and knowledge and skills won't give us the answer, it just gives us a direction to go and, and look further. So these things we call partial budgets, we use them to estimate the ex expected return on extra capital or a marginal return. That's the best way to have a first look when the beef production system is already in place. It takes into account time, it takes into account capital, it takes into account risk if you, do, if you think about those things. You've got to remember, there's always a tax angle uh, and it will vary from property to property. We haven't touched tax in any of these examples because it varies so much for different people and the tax angle can always change the results. So you've got to include some tax specialists in this discussion. All these analyses were compiled in a program, a suite of programs called Breakout Dynama, and uh, we put them up for free on our DAF website here in Queensland. You can download them, there's a use your manual, there's examples, if you want to look at this process of analysing these things. The report I talked about earlier, um, that's available on the Future Beef website, is called Improving the Performance of Beef Production Systems in Northern Australia. Uh, the report's part funded through our uh, drought and climate adaptation program via the project delivering integrated production economic knowledge and skills. Um, this project is led by Marie Bowen in Rocky um, and this, this is one of the uh, partial outputs part funded uh, by that project. 